All right. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship this morning at River Park. Uh, during this announcement time, I just want to mention that those of you who are gathered here in the sanctuary, if uh, we're, we're going to have communion as a part of our service. And so if you haven't already grabbed one of these little uh, cups with a wafer on top as, uh, from the entrance as you, as you came in, please just take a moment and grab one. We'll be using those later in our service. I want to start our service this morning, though, by taking a moment to recognize those who are hurting, uh, who are grieving and who are suffering because of the attack in Atlanta, Georgia, this past week, where a man shot and killed eight people, including six Asian women. I want us to remember those who are hurting and afraid because of the military coup in Myanmar. As Christ's church, we have the joy and the privilege of seeing and celebrating the image of God in people from every ethnic group. And so we condemn these acts of violence. We lament sins of racism, of white supremacy, the dehumanization of immigrants and of women. Our identity is in Christ. And God calls us as a church in Romans 12 to mourn with those who mourn, as well as to celebrate with those who celebrate. And so I want to hold up this beautiful piece of art that's created by members of our community. I'm hoping those of you on Zoom will be able to see it, but it's here on the wall to your right. It says in two languages, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's our confession or our profession of faith as God's people. And I want to celebrate our shared humanity and our shared life in Christ. We do not all have the same experiences, but each of us uh, celebrates our differences as beautiful and as glorifying to God who has made all of us in his image. To those, of, to those in our community, in other ethnic groups, in our church, please forgive those of us in the major group when we are too slow to speak on issues of racism, when we are too slow to embody Christ's love. Help us to grow more and more in the image of Christ. I also want to share a few words from, our, from the CRC's executive director, Colin Watson. Our brothers and sisters of Asian descent are hurting right now, and all of us hurt with them. To these men and women, I want to say that we are thinking about you. We are mourning with you. We pray for you. We care. May we all do what we can in our own areas of influence to combat racism and seek reconciliation. May we follow Jesus' example by engaging with the marginalized, comforting those who mourn, turning the tables on injustice. And may we all join together in prayer, especially for our Asian American brothers and sisters right now. So please join me in a word of prayer, and then we'll begin our worship service. Father God, we come to you this morning, grieving with those who grieve. God, give us your hands and your heart to love those of us who are hurting, those far from us who are, who are in pain. Help us to sit with those who are grieving. Humble our prejudices and help us to honor and celebrate your image in people from every culture. Help us with our words and our actions to make space for people from every tribe and tongue and nation and language. That all your people can be welcomed, enfolded, and celebrated for who you have made us to be. And always, Lord, draw us together only through Christ our Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. A few other announcements as we begin our worship service together. The first one is uh, wondering if you are new, because I'm new. Uh, those, some of you may not know, uh, but I'm Adrian DeLang and the pastor of Preaching, Care, and Spiritual Formation. Uh, I've been here a few months but today marks one year since the pandemic began, or, or at least one sun, a, sun, a year of Sundays since the pandemic began. And so if you've started attending or becoming part of River Park Church in the last year, I want to invite you to uh, informal kind of meet the pastor time on Zoom after the service, uh, two Sundays upcoming, both next Sunday, March 28th after the service, and Sunday, April 11th immediately after the service. We'll just have some time on Zoom to get to know one another, to share a little bit about the, um, the story of River Park and our vision statement and uh, an informal time to, for question and answers as well. So that'll be next Sunday after the service on Zoom and Sunday, April 11, after the service on Zoom. 
Uh, second note in our upcoming weekly email, uh, there's going to be an opportunity for any of you and all of you to sign up for conversation circles about our denomination's report on human sexuality. Groups are going to meet for five weeks. Right now we have time scheduled on Sunday nights and on Thursday nights. And so please sign up if you're interested. Uh, and if we have more interest than we can handle, or if other people would prefer other times, uh, we will be opening other groups as well. But we have two to start us out. Finally, uh, sign-ups for our Easter service are coming soon. Council wants to make sure that everyone who wants to gather in person for a worship service on Easter has the ability to do so. And so we're going to open up the service sign-ups for Easter soon. And uh, if we need to, we're going to explore some creative solutions to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to worship together in person if they would like on a Sunday morning, uh, on Easter Sunday morning. And as always, we're going to continue worshiping on Zoom together as well. So uh, with all those announcements set aside, uh, let's just bow our heads for a moment, come to God in prayer one more time, and then Henrik's or our worship team is going to open us uh, with the words of Psalm 62. Father God, in the midst of another full week, as we sit with those who grieve, as we rejoice with those who rejoice, we gather to worship different people with different experiences and different stories. Help us to all find our place in your family and in your kingdom this morning as we worship, as we sing, as we hear from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. On behalf of the worship team, I want to welcome you all and uh, invite you to stand with us as we, get, as we begin our first song. It's, in fact, written by Phil here on piano. It's based on Psalm 62, and I'll read just a portion of it before we begin the song. Yes, my soul, find rest in God. My hope comes from Him. Truly, He is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. My salvation and my honor depend on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. This will be a new song, so just follow the best you can. I'll find my rest in God alone. He will remain my cornerstone. He's like a fortress power. He saves me with his power. He's like the one who helps me go. He is the one who gives me hope. He is the one I trust. Thank you. 
it's important to thank Phil for contributing to this church, all his musical abilities. Now take a sign and wave to everybody. Wave. There's only one over there, and there's lots over here. So wave to each other. Hello. Say hello to each other. Hey, God uh, on high has given you, given you a name, has called you by name. He is your friend. So let's sing that. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. Who am I that you are mindful of me? That you hear me? When I call, is it true that you are thinking of me, how you love me? It's amazing, who am I, who am I that you are mindful of me?
Philippians 2, 9 through 11 says, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in earth and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. You were the word at the beginning, one with God the Lord most high. You're hidden. you feel free to raise your hands close your eyes whatever you can do to connect with the lord Ooh, he's worthy of all praise Ooh, death could not hold you the veil torn before you you silenced the boast of sin the heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory. Lord, you are raised to life again. You have no rival, you have no equal. Now and forever, God, you
Look full in His wonderful face And the things of earth will grow strangely dim In the light of His glory and grace. Please be seated. As we worship, we bring our fears and our anxieties to God. And uh, we don't, or we shouldn't make the mistake of just looking for information to meet that fear and anxiety. Instead, we look for the joy of the Lord and the comfort of the Lord. So I'm going to uh, read for us a question and answer, or I invite you to join me with the answer. But question one of the Heidelberg Catechism, I'm going to read the question and invite you to join me, those of you here in the sanctuary and on Zoom, in reading together the answer about our comfort. So, congregation of Jesus Christ, what is your only comfort in life and in death? That I am not my own, but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. Because I belong to him, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. Our elder, Hank, is going to lead us in a word of prayer from Zoom. Good morning, family of God. Please join me in our congregational prayer. Heavenly Father, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and our Comforter, Holy Spirit, triune God, thank you for your perfect love that gives us life and purpose each day and sustains our world, and yes, all of creation. Today, and I believe the second day of spring, we thank you, Lord, for sustaining us over this past winter, and that we can look forward to this new season of spring with all the new life that, is, that it brings in nature, and I believe in us. Lord, it is your love that sustains us, and makes us able to face each day with confidence, hope, and strength. Help us to be channels of your love and peace when we live our lives with thankful hearts and a strong desire to live for you. Thank you, Lord, for our church family, our pastors, elders, and deacons, and all the ministry leaders serving us and helping us to become more and more your loving presence in our world around us. Thank you for all the ministries of our church and may they equip us to grow closer to you and help us to understand your purposes for our lives as individuals and as a church. Help us to pray for each other and encourage each other to live for you and to love each other in good and difficult times and truly reflect being the family of God. Lord, we pray for your blessing on our troubled world today. So many scary things are happening that we do not understand or control. Please help us, Lord, to trust in you alone and continue to be your loving presence in our world every day. Lord, we pray for your blessing on our leaders in our city, province, country, Yes, all world leaders, that they may discern your will for your world. We long for peace in hearts of and lives of all people. We pray for your protections of all the refugees, wherever they are, and help us as people and nations to extend hospitality to them and welcome them and provide hope for a peaceful existence and a connection with Christians and come to know 
the Prince of Peace. This is you, Lord. Dear Lord, we pray for your blessing on our shut-ins, our elderly, and those not worshiping with us for whatever reasons today. Lord, we pray for all those struggling with the effects of COVID-19, which affects so many people in so many different ways. May our hope be found in you and you alone. Please give strength to all our medical people, the nurses and doctors and caregivers because of the challenges they face each day. We pray for your blessing on Joss and on George and Cor and Willie and Leticia who, have recover, who are recovering from surgery. And we pray for your blessing on the hip surgery tomorrow, tomorrow for Nelica Smith and others that are currently needing special medical care. Please bless Irene and Harry Simonick that they may experience your nearness, love and comfort when they're dealing with Harry's many health concerns. Thank you, Lord, that you know what is going on in our lives, what our needs are, and that you will take care of all of us because we belong to you and you, only you are our comfort. Because we belong to each other, Lord, please stir us on to maintain contact with each other as our brothers and sisters in Christ and to show our love. Lord, we confess that this past week, we have not lived and loved as you would like us to. And we ask you, Lord, that you will forgive us. And we thank you for dying on the cross for our sins. As we partake of the Lord's Supper today and listen to your word, Fill us with your Holy Spirit so that we will be renewed. We may be fully thankful and encouraged to serve you in the week before us. We pray that you will fill Pastor Adrian with your Holy Spirit so that he will be able to speak your word boldly and clearly in his sermon titled, Lord, Teach Us to Pray. Thank you, dear Lord, that we as your children may open our hearts to you and know that you are listening and will provide for all our needs. We love you, Lord, and pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Speak, oh Lord, as we come to you to receive the food of your home.
What a beautiful way to prepare our hearts to open up God's Word. We're going to do that together in just a moment by reading Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 15. Jesus' disciples come to him and they say, as uh, Hank said in his prayer, Lord, teach us to pray. And Matthew records Jesus' answer here in uh, part of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, When you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by other people. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, don't keep babbling on like the pagans, for they think that they'll be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your heavenly Father knows what you need even before you ask him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And then Jesus adds these final words. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your heavenly Father will not forgive your sins. So far, the reading of God's word. May it bless our hearts and our lives. I was 16 years old. I was driving my parents' car for probably the third or fourth time since I got my license and was allowed to drive without an adult supervision. The youth group at my church had just gone skiing together, and I loaded up a few friends in the back of my car, did a few donuts in the parking lot to show off, and then headed down the road for about an hour drive home. Almost immediately, the car began to sputter and then died. I've got us, yeah, and all those lights on the dash popped up, accusing me. I panicked, looked around, and realized that I had run out of gas. Pretty cool. Now, hours from home, what would you do? Or an hour from home, what would you do in that situation? Tim Keller has a quote that I think is really helpful here. Religion says, I'm in trouble. Dad's going to kill me. The gospel says, I'm in trouble. I better call my dad. What do we do when we get ourselves in trouble? When we're out of gas and not just, not just foolish and me, like me and physically out of gas because we forgot to fill up the car, but when we're afraid, when we're discouraged, when we are exhausted and on edge. I think more than we'd like to admit, certainly those of us uh, in, uh, in the Western world and in, in mainstream culture, we, we think the first way rather than the second. When, in ev- when eventually we do come to our Heavenly Father in prayer, we come with the attitude that says, oh no, God's going to kill me. I'm in trouble. God's going to punish me. Most often when it comes to prayer, we don't come to God on a regular basis. We come to God when we're in trouble. We come to God when we're out of gas. We come to God when we're afraid. And even then, when we are dry and impoverished, we do not ask expecting the answer of a loving father. We ask as people who are afraid that we won't hear anything. Or worse, afraid because we expect an angry answer of a vengeful God who will use our sin 
or our brokenness as a weapon against us. Prayer is very simply talking with God. Prayer is about conversation and about relationship. And like any conversation or relationship, prayer has two sides. Jesus teaches his disciples a a model for prayer in speaking to the Father. But shows through the words surrounding what we know as the Lord's Prayer, that he expects and, in, and, teach, and expects his disciples to expect that God will respond to them. Jesus expects and, and teaches his disciples to expect that prayer is about relationship. And so he models what intimate relationship and love, with, love for God, love from God looks like. Not just in the Lord's Prayer, but throughout his life and ministry. And he models that this love that is, comes from God to fill us when we are dry also overflows out of us into others. After all, the Lord's Prayer is not, or, or, or the words I and me and my don't show up in the Lord's Prayer. It's us and our that, that love that God has for you as an individual and for me as an individual, inevitably, Jesus teaches us, overflows into a communal identity, into a shared love for one another, those of us who are part of God's family, and love for others, those outside of God's family. This is one of many reasons why it's so important as God's people, that we speak up and speak out against hate crimes. It's also a reason why we pursue multicultural ministry. Because we want the us of the Lord's prayer. When we pray, your kingdom come, Lord, we're, we're asking that God would make our community here on earth look more and more like the community of believers from every tribe and nation and people and language gathered around the throne in heaven already. We want our community here on earth to look like heaven. That's that picture of God's kingdom. Intimate love and relationship with God as individuals and communal identity and love for others together as a community. So what is Jesus teaching us to say or teaching us to pray in the Lord's Prayer. We're just going to spend a few moments and go through these line by line. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Probably some of you have heard before that when Jesus says our Father, the Greek word is Abba. That means Father, but it's what a child says to a parent or to a, to a dad. It really means dad or daddy. It's not just saying, oh my, oh, my father who is far away and who is the leader of our family unit. That's a child speaking to dad. Daddy, are you there? Do you hear me? But it's not just dad. It's our father who is in heaven. We don't just have, a, we aren't just friends of God as we sang. We're not just children of God, but our, our God is also the king of the entire universe. He rules and reigns from heaven. And so Jesus frames the beginning of this prayer with those, those dual identities of our heavenly father. He's both our daddy and the Lord of all the universe. He's father and king. We are part of his covenant family, and we have the the rewards of his covenant family, the inheritance of God's children. But we are also part of God's kingdom, and we join God in the responsibilities of doing his kingdom work with him. Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When we say to God, your kingdom come, your will be done, we're humbly saying, your power, Lord, not my power. 
We're saying your way, God, not my way. Your power is greater than my power. Your way is better than my way. I get myself into trouble all the time. But I recognize that you have good plans, not just for the universe, but for me. So may your will be done in my life, in our lives. And may your kingdom come on earth, as I already alluded to, so that our community and our our shared lives here on earth will more and more begin to look like the future that awaits us in heaven. And not just a future where we're all uh, gathered in pews, as it were, singing and and, and forward-facing the throne, but that earth would look more and more like the heaven that Reformed Christians have preached about and celebrated and look forward to for centuries. A renewed heaven and a renewed earth. Everyone in right relationship with everyone and everything else. This is what we pray when we pray, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. God, give us the humility And the courage and the willingness to pursue making this place the the more and more how you will redeem and restore it, God, to be. Give us, Lord, our daily bread. It's a small thing, I think, for most of us to go and get bread. We're going to celebrate communion in just a moment. And yesterday, my wife and I went to the grocery store, and I bought that loaf of bread for less than $2. And uh, there was a whole wall of bread. I, could, I had my choice of, of hundreds of loaves of bread. And any, any grocery store I went to would have been the same. But my African mentor in seminary, I still remember sitting with him in his home, where he said, Most white people don't understand praying, give us today our daily bread. He said, where I grew up in Africa, we understood that when you ask God for your daily bread, that's all you're going to get. That's all you're going to get. Do we really pray when we pray, God, give us our daily bread? Do we really believe that everything I need to eat today comes from you, God? Everything I need for for my relationships comes from you. All my finances and all my disposable income that I have to spend, that's, that's a gift from God that he has provided to me. Give me, Lord, today the food, the money, the energy for relationships, the fulfillment in my career, in my family, with my friends. Give me the joy that sustains me. Because if we don't get it from you, Lord, I won't have anything. Give us today our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we have also forgiven our debtors. I have fallen short this week. And not just this week, but every week preceding. Others have too. We forgive one another, not because we, are, we have become such gracious and kind and generous people that we allow others to be near us even though they hurt us. That's not how forgiveness works. We forgive others their debts more and more when we come to realize as God's people just how great a debt God has forgiven from me, from you, from us. This is why Jesus goes on to explain what is perhaps the the most difficult part of the prayer in verses 14 and 15. He says, when you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you don't forgive others their sins, your heavenly Father will not forgive you your sins. That seems like such harsh words from Jesus. 
But what we need to understand is that when we don't forgive others, we demonstrate that we have not understood and we have not experienced and internalized the deep and great love that God has showered upon us, the grace and mercy that he has shared with us undeserved, and the forgiveness that has removed my sin, your sin, as far as the east is from the west. The humility in seeing ourselves as we are and in seeing just how much God has forgiven us inevitably leads to an overflowing of grace and forgiveness for one another. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. God, keep us Keep us from sinning more. As we are humble in extending forgiveness to others, we're humble in understanding our limits as well. As scripture says that apart from God, we can do no good thing. So Father, keep keep me from sinning more. Keep me from the temptation that I would so easily fall into. And not, not just, Lord, don't give me more than I can handle on my own. God promises that we are not able to do this life by ourselves and our own strength and our own power. And so we, we, pray, we don't pray, Lord, uh, Lord don't, let, don't give me more than I can handle. But we pray, Lord, you are leading me. You are walking with me. And so don't take me somewhere where your grace cannot cover Don't take me somewhere where I am no longer willing to follow you and instead become distracted by temptations and and the other distract excuse me, distractions of our world. And protect us from Satan, from all the work of Satan and his demonic forces in the world that we cannot see. Jesus teaches us to to pray to the Father who is unseen who fights a battle and and works for our good in so many ways that we cannot see. And then closes the prayer by saying, deliver us from the evil as well that we cannot see. Why? As I said, introducing this prayer. So that we might grow deeper in intimate relationship with God that we might experience more deeply and more fully and more daily the overwhelming love of God for his people. And that that love might overflow, not just for me, and not even just for my biological family, for me and my wife, but, but for the family of God, the people from every tribe and nation and language and tongue who gather together, even at River Park Church. And for those outside the family of God. That we might have intimate relationship and communal joy. I'll give you, uh, I'll give you one more example of what I think is going on here in the Lord's Prayer. That Jesus isn't just teaching his disciples, in other words, the words that they ought to say but he's trying to reform their, reform their lives and reform their hearts so that they understand who God is and understand their place, the rewards that God has for them, their place in God's family, and their responsibility, their role in God's kingdom. One other example or model of what that kind of changed heart looks like. This time I'll use the example of my wife. She's wonderful, isn't she? I I could go on and see how red I could get her, but I won't. That's not the point. Yesterday, uh, many of you know, some of you know, was my birthday. And Kaylee said to me yesterday, she said, it's your birthday, so we're going to do the things that you want to do. We're going to go where you want to go. We're going to eat where you want to eat. That's one of the ways, one of the wonderful ways that Kaylee loves me. She sets aside her desires 
and takes joy in the time that we have together, takes joy in serving others, and in this case, me, and takes joy in me getting to do what I want to do. That's a model for me of what love looks like. I think Jesus wants to teach us this morning that we'll only grow in our prayer lives, we'll only grow in our relationships with God when our hearts are changed, when we love God and desire deeper intimacy with him. And we'll only grow in relationships with one another when we, when we love them. When our hearts are changed and we grow to desire deeper intimacy with them. With others who look like us. With Kaylee who looks like me, right? Blonde hair and blue eyes. And with so many others who look different. Who have different ethnicities and different cultures and yet are just as much loved by God. And this is not just our responsibility as God's people. It's what God has already done for us. It's what Christ did for us on the cross. He set aside security in heaven. He set, uh, he he considered something, equality with God, not as something to be held on to, but he set it aside. He set aside his desire or his, his comfort. And Jesus took great joy in becoming human, and spending time with people on earth, in serving us, in loving us, and took great joy in helping us fulfill not only our, our desires, but our, who God has made us to be, our, our full potential of what it means to be human. In the simplest language, we love Because he first loved us. I know that probably some of you at least are expecting a sermon on prayer to be more didactic and more instructive. This is exactly how you should pray. And these are the four things or the five things that you should say. Our our reformed tendency or our Christian reformed tendency, I think, is always to go for more information and more instruction. But Jesus and scripture doesn't do that. When Christians face guilt and fear, God doesn't just give us more information. God meets us. He sits with us and he offers the peace that passes understanding. He offers us the joy of the kingdom. Do you know the joy of the Lord? Not in, a, not in just a headway where you know what passages to look up in Scripture that talk about the joy of the Lord, but do you know the joy of the Lord? Have you experienced a Father who loves you, who has given up so much for you? Do you, do you know in your heart the joy of what it means to be part of God's family, to be cared for and held up when you are weak? Do you know the love of someone sitting with you, passing up over a box of Kleenex and remaining while you are hurting? Do you know the joy of someone celebrating you and your accomplishments and being present to care about your activities and the things that you care about? Do you know the love of the Lord? At this past Uh, our council meeting this past Thursday, Pastor Harrison shared a devotion from a Japanese theologian. I'm going to shamelessly steal this story, Harrison. So he gets the credit. This, This Japanese theologian told a story of a man who owned a shop. And every day, many different people came into his shop. And no matter what they did or what they wanted or what they needed, He was kind to them. He helped them. He answered kindly. He answered helpfully. He provided what he could to meet their needs. And those of you, those of us who have worked in retail, 
know that that's not always an easy thing. And so this theologian met this shopkeeper and he asked him, how is it that you always love people and you always respect them no matter, no matter what they say to you or do or ask? And the shopkeeper took him around outside the store to the back and he said, whenever I'm tired, whenever I'm discouraged, I go over there and I sit under that tree and I pray. And I ask God to give me love for these other people because my love is not enough. I ask God to fill me with love for others because I don't have enough to give. Pastor Harrison closed the devotion by calling us as counsel to remember that we were unlovable when God found us. Remember that we were unlovable when God found us. Do you know the love of the Lord? The love that found you when you were unlovable, that met you when you were tired, when you were out of gas, when you were afraid. What I want for you, River Park Church, what I want for all of us, is that we would follow the examples that we have, the living examples, but also the perfect example of Jesus. And that we would pray the Lord's Prayer, not as a, as a formula or as a, as a perfect model, that these are exactly the words that I need to say, but that we would pray the Lord's Prayer because we have experienced intimacy with God, our Father, our Daddy. That we know how deeply He loves us. And that we have experienced and want more to experience the joy and the peace that comes from that intimacy so that we can share that with others. That we can receive it from others who themselves have experienced that joy and that intimacy as well. That's how we pray. Not by a formula, not by specific words on a page, but by bringing who we are to God. By quieting our hearts. By speaking to God and by listening to God. By sharing with others and by listening to them. So that as Paul says, we all grow more and more and more into the head who is Christ. In just a moment, we're going to celebrate communion and focus on Christ. And then we're going to sing together, Turn Your Eyes on Jesus. So let's pause for a moment, close in prayer here, and prepare our hearts to receive God's blessings and to sing. Father God, we come to you and we celebrate your deep and great love for us. We celebrate that you emptied yourself, that you gave yourself for us, that you did not hold back, that you loved us while we remained unlovable. Holy Spirit, work in our hearts as we listen, as we partake in communion, as we sing, and as we go out to live and serve in the coming week, work in our hearts so that we become more and more people who look like you, so that our hands and our feet are not doing what we want, but that we would become your hands and your feet, truly your body for one another, growing all the more to be like Jesus, your son, our head. It's in his name we pray. Amen. We come to the table and you are invited to partake in the Lord's Supper. 
The Apostle Paul teaches the Corinthian church to remember and to believe and to celebrate Jesus' sacrifice for all of us. Before the the words that we commonly know, the Apostle Paul teaches the Corinthians that they need to care for one another. They need to make room for all God's people at the table. Some should meet before others, and no one should, should go ahead. We should wait for one another, make space for one another, Paul says. Why? Because I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. That on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had broken it, he gave it to his disciples. He said, this bread is my body. Eat from it for the forgiveness of your sins. And after dinner, Jesus took the cup. And he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Drink from it for the forgiveness of of your sins. The Apostle Paul, and in Scripture, the Holy Spirit promises that whenever we eat this bread, and whenever we drink this cup, we proclaim Jesus' death until he comes again. That's what unites us as God's people. Christ's death and our suffering that we share with him. But also what unites us is Christ's resurrection and his resurrection life. And so this morning, if those of you who are here, you have your little pre-filled cup and wafer. And those of you who are on Zoom or are worshiping from home, I hope you have elements with you as well. Take, eat, remember and believe the body and the blood of Jesus given for you for the complete forgiveness of of all of your sins. We do this so quietly. Jesus Jesus warned his people, you know this, right? That if we keep silent, the the rocks would cry out. I think we're having the the crinkling of plastic cry out, and also the woodpeckers on the side of our building are crying out as well. Let's come to God in a word of prayer, thanking him for what he's done for us. Father God, we, we praise you that all, our life is in you. That all the good you have given us comes from you. Help us to share the things that you have given us with one another. To share the joys, to share the blessings, but also to share the difficulties and the struggles. Not because we owe it to one another in some philosophical way, but because you modeled for us the perfect way to do that, to share in life together, and that there is great joy and even more life, not just in living alone by ourselves, but in being part of your family and your, your body. So this morning, Lord, as we take communion, we pray that this bread and this juice, these ordinary things, that they would be for us, extraordinary manifestations of your Holy Spirit's power and presence, that you would fill us with everything we need to do your will in the week to come, and that we would be Christ to the people that we meet, to those who we know and love, to those who are like us, to those who are different from us, to those who are part of your family, and to those who are still far off. God, you send us this week, and so send us with your power. In Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Let's stand together. Look full in His wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. Lord, listen to Your children praying. Lord, send Your Spirit in this place. Lord, listen to Your children praying. Send us love, send us power, send us grace. Okay, come on, church, let's bring it back. Yeah. Lord, listen to your children praying. We send your spirit in this place. Lord, listen. Lord, listen to your children praying. Send us. Send us love. Send us power. Send us grace. All right, now the children, all together. Lord. Listen to your children singing. We join. We join the angels in their praise. Lord, listen to your children singing. We give thanks with our voice as we raise. All right, listen again. Here we go. Lord, listen to your children praising. As we go to lift God's name on high, God goes with you and he blesses you. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the power of the Holy Spirit go with you and remain with you all. And all God's people say, Amen. My hope and strength is gone. You're the one who calls me on. You are the life. You are the fight that's in my soul. Oh, your resurrection power burns like fire in my heart. When waters rise, I lift my eyes up to your throne. Yes. We risen and on high greater is he living in me than in the world no surrender no retreat we are free and we're redeemed we will declare over despair you are the Oh, Lord. 
nothing is impossible every chain is breakable with you you are victorious you are stronger than our hearts you are greater than the dark with you we are victorious nothing is impossible every chain is breakable with you we are victorious you are stronger than our hearts you are greater than the dark with you we are victorious we are more than conquerors through christ you have overcome this world this life we will not bow to sin or to shame we are defiant in your name you are the fire that cannot be tamed you are the power in our veins our lord our lord our conqueror we are more we are more than conquerors through christ you have overcome this world this life we will not bow to sin or to shame we are defiant in your name you are the fire that cannot be tamed you are the power in our veins oh lord our lord our conqueror Well, it's great to be together in the sanctuary. It's great to be together on Zoom. We encourage those on Zoom to go into breakout groups and fellowship. We encourage this unit to physically, I hate the word socially distance because I want you to socially connect outside. So physically, distancely walk out and then socialize outside. And we will see you in the next few weeks. One, two, and three. And three.